3,000 pounds of race car out of control. You're gonna lose it, you're gonna crash, you're gonna spin. Motorcycles crumple in high-speed smash-ups. A woman hits the earth from over 10,000 feet with a failed parachute. I was certain I was gonna die from that impact. From colliding asteroids to subatomic particles, now crashes on modern marvels. High speeds, close formations, split second maneuvers. Yellow flag, yellow flag, yellow. All the things that make auto racing so thrilling also make it deadly. Actor turned race car driver Frankie Muniz knows just how dangerous the sport can be. Being a race car driver, you know you're going to be involved in uh, accidents every once in a while, big crashes and stuff. It's kind of something that comes with the territory of being a driver. You know it's going to happen, and most of the time you can't avoid it. And they hurt. Last season, I actually uh, fractured my back, um, broke my wrist, broke my ankle, broke six ribs. <laughs> So I've, 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 had a, I've had a few big ones. One of the primary causes for auto racing crashes is driver error. The driver's always trying to find the limit on the car. How far can I break? You know, how, how fast can I take this corner? Can I go a little bit faster? And sometimes you just take it a little bit too fast and the car just doesn't have the grip, doesn't, can't take that speed and you lose control of the car and hit the wall. On average, there's one serious injury for every 300 racing accidents. But 40 years ago, that ratio was one in 10. When I started IndyCar racing in the late 60s, you know, we, we lost a guy a weekend. You know, there's a lot of fire deaths, there are a lot of deaths from extremity injuries and head injuries and that kind of stuff. I mean, basically it was a tube frame car with a 70 gallon fuel tank on the back and the driver just hung out in the open. There's nothing to protect them. Crashes have been part of auto racing since its earliest days. In 1911, the very first Indy 500 had a multi-car pileup just 13 laps into the race. As cars got faster, dangers increased. Early on in motorsports, the focus was make the car fast, then make it reliable, and then worry about safety afterward. The 1958 Indy race saw one of its largest accidents. Car number five, the Zinc Special, is the first direct, another over the wall, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six cars piled up here on the northeast turn. The fatal flip of driver Pat O'Connor's car led to mandated metal roll bars and medically certified helmets for Indy drivers. The fire threat diminished in the 1970s when racing took a cue from the U.S. military. They brought a helicopter fuel cell to Indianapolis Speedway and said, look, you can shoot a gun into this thing, you can hit it with an ax, you can do whatever you want and it won't penetrate it. So we started running those in our cars. That went away. There was no more deaths from fire. In the 1980s, carbon fiber replaced steel plates and aluminum tubing in race car construction. The result was a lighter yet stronger vehicle, capable of deflecting energy away from the driver. So when you crash, everything disintegrates. All these suspension parts, the wheels, the front wing, everything is designed to break off the car fairly easily and that way it, the, the impact is it's absorbed by the car, not absorbed by the driver. Here's the math. A car in motion builds up kinetic energy. The heavier the car and the faster it goes, the more the kinetic energy increases. A 3,600 pound racing car traveling at 180 miles per hour has enough kinetic energy to launch an average man five miles into the air. If that race car runs head on into a concrete barrier, all the kinetic energy is released in the milliseconds it takes for the vehicle to stop, with all of the force being absorbed by the car and driver. Mm -hmm. 
A crash in which a car spins, tumbles, and shatters releases the kinetic energy over a greater period of time, dispersing the force. Whenever there's a crash on a racetrack, it's the job of the safety team to respond. These specially trained paramedic firefighters can be on the scene of an accident within 15 to 30 seconds, offering life-saving medical support and vehicle extrication. Vehicle extrication is most easily defined as removing the vehicle from around the patient as opposed to removing the patient from the vehicle. And what we will do is we will cut the car apart around him so that we can limit the movement to the driver and minimize any further injury to the driver to get him out. In the event we have to cut a driver from the car because he's caught inside the cockpit, we can utilize one of our Amatro rescue tools. This is a combination tool. We can either spread the carbon fiber or cut it. The most frequent injury that we've seen has uh, probably been orthopedic injuries, arms and legs and things. We've done such a good job of, of safety um, uh, with the new Hans devices and, and then limiting the head and neck movement that uh, we don't see nearly as many of those injuries as we used to. The Hans, or head and neck support device, was designed by Dr. Robert Hubbard in the 1980s in response to the death of a friend who suffered head and neck injuries in an auto racing crash. Use of the Hans device was initially voluntary. It was not widely employed. But now, following the death of racing giant Dale Earnhardt Sr. in February 2001, nearly every major race sanctioning body requires its use. That was the biggest problem when you crashed. Your neck and your head was the only thing that was loose on the car because, because you, you were tightened by so many seat belts. Every time you crashed, you could break your neck if, if you went forward, if you went sideways. It's actually a very simple safety device that will prevent the driver from, in, from injuring their neck. So the seat belt goes on top of this hands device where my hands are. So in case there's an accident, you see, this is as far as my neck goes because the hands device immediately grabs the helmet from over here. I have had hard crashes at over 200 miles an hour and thanks to the hands device, nothing has happened to my neck. And it's, which is funny, when they introduced it, drivers didn't want to wear it because they thought it was uncomfortable. And now, you, you would never think of driving without the hands device. It would be like almost driving without wheels on your car. Even more lives might be saved by the adoption of another breakthrough in motorsport engineering. Safer barriers standing for steel and foam energy reduction barriers. As this test footage shows, the vehicle slams into the barrier with tremendous force, but the wall compresses, absorbing the energy of the collision. The outer layer closest to the track is made of hollow 8-inch steel tubes, which are both strong and flexible during an impact. The center layer is dense 22-inch thick polystyrene foam, which absorbs energy by compressing. The inner layer nearest the spectators is solid concrete to provide resistance. With soft walls, there's a certain amount of elasticity and give, and as a consequence of that, why the driver has a fairly good chance of being able to survive a fairly strong impact against those walls after a collision has occurred. Race cars may avoid even more crashes, thanks to revolutionary changes in racing electronics. Here at the Panther Racing Team facility in Indianapolis, Indiana, the crew prepares their car for the Indy 500. They're installing communication systems that didn't exist 10 years ago. Not only on this car, but on all 33 cars participating in this year's race, there are several safety components that are mandatory for each car. The familiar yellow caution flag that warns drivers of an accident on the racetrack is now augmented by an onboard signal sent electronically by race officials. This is our track condition radio. It receives messages from race control when there's a caution or yellow flag on the, on the track. This box is located here on the car and receives a signal from the antenna link here and then drives two LEDs on here at this location to alert the driver that there's been a caution it comes on very quickly, and at traveling at 200 miles an hour, you're traveling almost a football field a second, and any early warning you can get will help you avoid contact with another car. The team also installs a data acquisition recorder in case a crash occurs. 
This helps us get information from crashes on what happens to the driver and the car during an accident. This is very similar to a crash box on an airplane. 60 sensors on the car gather information ranging from brake pressure and g-forces to steering inputs and ride height changes. The accident data recorder not only receives data from sensors located on the car, but it also receives data from sensors located in the driver's ears. These earpieces, which also provide uh, communication to the team, provide us with G-load data about what happens to the driver's head during an accident. After a crash, G-force data from the driver's earpieces are downloaded from the accident data recorder and analyzed. During the analysis, we're looking for, one, how much force the driver experienced or how much injury he might have sustained in the crash based on acceleration and then two if there's anything that can be done to the car to make it safer in the future. This is a crash from two years ago at Indy. Uh, you can see turns one and two down the front stretch, turn three and then the driver crash is going into turn four. You can see the first spike here where the car actually breaks loose. At this point here the car has lost traction and starts to slide slides across the track and here he hits the wall. The driver's head saw approximately 80 G's and the car saw about 150 G's. As data is analyzed and you look at the injuries and the, the performance of a car in a crash and they make improvements to the cars to make them safer, the trend is to see fewer injuries. I think the next step for us from a safety standpoint is not just to get data from a driver's earpieces, but we're going to also start putting sensors on the seat belts and get data from the loads that the driver experiences during the accident with respect to his torso. Sensors are going to get better. We may be able to monitor heart rate and respiration rate on the drivers during the race, and that's just going to make the whole thing safer for everybody. While crashes in auto racing are becoming safer, Another motorsport is becoming more dangerous, riding motorcycles. In 1955, a race car in Le Mans, France, crashed, killing the driver and over 80 spectators. It is racing's deadliest accident. Crashes will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Crashes on Modern Marvels. There are over six million motorcycles on the road in the United States. 100,000 riders are involved in crashes each year. And 5,000 of those are fatal. I'd say it's risky. Statistics would show it's about, oh, maybe 25 to 30 times more dangerous, if you want to use that word, than car driving. Deadly motorcycle crashes doubled in the last 10 years and the numbers continue to rise due to motorcycle automobile collisions. Three-fourths of the crashes occurred at intersections in a motorcycle car crash, and two-thirds of that time it was a car driver violating the right of way of the motorcyclist. If it's an intersection crash, the car driver usually doesn't see the motorcyclist. Understanding the mechanics of motorcycle crashes is the business of exponent failure analysis. In general, we hope to learn specifics about how a vehicle performs in a crash, both how it crushes, how it absorbs energy, how it cushions the occupants and protects them in the crash, and also how the occupants perform. We do this for insurance carriers, motorcycle manufacturers, and then we do a lot of litigation-related work. Exponent Failure Analysis conducts crash tests at its 147-acre research facility in Phoenix, Arizona. Today we're going to be testing some motorcycle impact mechanics, uh, a motorcycle hitting a passenger vehicle. The motorcycle in this test will be going down the rail at approximately 30 miles an hour, and we've got a car that's going to be coming across from our 90 degree road. It's going to be coming in at 15 miles an hour. A half mile long wire cable accelerates the vehicles to impact speed. We're in the engine room where we have two large block Ford V8 engines in series to drive the cables that move the cars for the crash test. That drives the cable systems. The two cable systems are interlocked by two heavy truck transmissions that give us about 100 different gear ratios for controlling the relative speeds of the two vehicles that hit each other. The exponent team painstakingly prepares the car, the motorcycle, 
crash test dummy, and the seven cameras that will record the impact. This is the onboard dolly camera, which will be traveling down with the motorcycle. And uh, I have to set the aperture and make sure that it's set for the 500 frames a second that we'll be um, recording it at. Photo, you guys ready? Standing by. You shoot from the side to get the pitch motion of the motorcycle. The boom's going up. You shoot from the top so you can study how much it rotates on impact. And then you shoot from the front so you can study where the occupant comes over the back. Hector, you ready? Roll out, she's all yours. Just throttle up. 15 feet before impact, the vehicles are released from the cable and hurtle towards one another with their own momentum. Perfect. Good hit. See how the dummy came off? Yep. It's all over in the blink of an eye, but the high-speed cameras reveal much more. The initial contact with the car, what happens is the front tire starts to engage the car. At that point, the forks start to rotate and once you hit the steering limit, that's where you get some twist in the forks. And at the same time, the bike is still coming in, compressing the forks against the car. And that's where everything gets folded back. And you've got solid contact. Exponents researchers survey the wreckage. So the front wheel impacts here in the door. Bike spins around. The axle's hitting right here, or the forks. Dummy hits up here. Then you can see the same damage you can see on the front of the helmet where the, uh, where the dummy's helmet came into contact with the car, right here. We've got a central strike here uh, from the dummy's pelvis denting in the tank. And the bike also rotated out from under the dummy, so he also has a strike on the one side of the bike. As the side of the bike presented itself, his pelvis continued and dented in here. We'll be able to see that better on the, on the high-speed video. The 500 frames per second video slows the action by more than 16 times. As the wheel engages, the uh, bike slows down rapidly and the motorcyclist keeps going at the same speed. The rider's pelvis comes into contact with the tank and then right after that we get a glancing head contact or helmet contact with the rear corner of the vehicle. Probably would not have caused uh, any significant head injury. But I wouldn't uh, sell this short. There is injury potential here because of that pelvic. In addition to the video evidence, Christine will consult the data from dozens of sensors mounted on the dummy. He's built with lots of instrumentation built in in his head, his neck, his chest, his leg, as we see here, to uh, measure the forces in the accident and tell us whether an injury may have occurred in that accident. This is the chest cavity and the rib cage of the dummy. We've removed the front structure or sternum, so you can see there's a computer or data acquisition system that's been installed inside. And that allows the dummy to be free-flying and not be tethered to a computer on the ground and still measure data from lots of sensors. Data recorded by these sensors in this crash will allow Exponent to recreate the physical crash test in the lab. We're going to take the dummy we used in the crash test with the car, put it on this bike, which is tethered to the sled system here. So the idea here is to replicate the motion and the impact forces that the motorcycle saw hitting the car here on the sled so that we can study how the motorcycle works over and over again without breaking motorcycles all the time. The 9,000 pound sled will accelerate up to 30 miles per hour in 150 feet. Filming the event with high-speed cameras requires 300 kilowatts of light, enough electricity to power 100 average homes. The Exponent team launches the sled. Three, two, one, fire. The slow motion cameras reveal that the replication of the crash test was a success. What we're seeing in the sled test is the sled stopping as if it was hitting the car, the motorcycle moving in the same manner as if it hit the car, and the dummy coming off of the motorcycle in the same manner. 
We just take a motorcycle on a sled, run it over and over again, looking at different components, and only consuming one motorcycle, not dozens of them. Crash tests helped researchers adapt one of the car industry's most successful safety technologies to motorcycles, the airbag. Honda has developed a fuel tank mounted airbag for its Goldwing model that takes just 0.15 seconds to deploy. Upon impact, sensors in the front fork detect a velocity change. Nitrogen gas releases into the airbag, which absorbs the forward energy of the rider, reducing injuries. If an airbag on your bike isn't enough, how about an airbag jacket? When a rider is thrown from a cycle, a sensor activates a CO2 cartridge, inflating the jacket to provide neck and upper body protection. Several brands of airbag jackets are already on the market. Other safety breakthroughs, like riding trainers, allow motorcyclists to gain defensive driving experience without even venturing on the road. Turn left at the next traffic light. The function is just like a basic motorcycle. You have a, a clutch that operates, mirrors, throttle, brake, and your gear shifter. It gives you realistic situations. Things do pop out at you. You really have to be a defensive rider on a motorcycle. And you have to be, always be aware of your surroundings. Considering the rider's vulnerability, motorcycle experts agree that one safety factor is more important than all others. I would say that the helmet is the most important, and that's because I think the brain is the most important part of your body. Inside the helmet, we have uh, energy absorbing material, like a foam, uh, as well as a abrasion resistant surface that goes over that. And uh, this energy absorbing material will crush when the head impacts a hard surface and that will uh, absorb energy and reduce the acceleration that is seen by the skull and the brain inside. Basic things you want to look for in a helmet is you want to make sure that they have minimum DOT uh, approval, which is Department of Transportation. Next thing you want to look for is snow approval, which is an impact rating. To receive a certification from the not-for-profit Snell Memorial Foundation, helmets undergo a rigorous battery of tests including impact resistance, face shield strength, and chin guard deflection. It's the most important uh, safety item you can wear. Um, it's, you know, it comes out how valuable is your head. Even at modest speeds, the impact of a motorcycle collision can be devastating. Now, imagine a skydiver on a crash course with solid ground after experiencing parachute failure. Amazingly, some have lived to tell their tale. Motorcyclists over 40 represent half of all U.S. riders and also half of all cycle crash fatalities. Crashes will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Crashes on Modern Marvels. Free-falling from 10,000 feet. Skydivers trust both their training and equipment to get them safely back to Earth. But sometimes things can go terribly wrong. Hi, Santa. <laughs> All right, Santa, what are you getting ready to do? My first AFF. All righty then, good job. On October 9, 2005, 21-year-old skydiver Shana Richardson jettisoned her main parachute and experienced a malfunction on her reserve parachute. She hurtled to Earth and crashed face first onto an asphalt parking lot. Remarkably, she survived. I broke just about every bone in my face. Uh, the doctors describe it as eggshell fractures. Broke all the bones in my cheekbones and in my nose and my eye sockets. I knocked out the top front five teeth of my mouth. I broke my pelvis in three places and I had broken my leg as well. I should have died. I shouldn't be alive. Worldwide, approximately 60 people die while skydiving annually. A third of those fatalities result from failure of the canopy to deploy. That's what happened with Shana's reserve chute. The dynamics of parachute failure can be complex, 
involving everything from equipment malfunctions, weather conditions, and most frequently, operator error. Bob Feisty Feisthamel is a U.S. Parachuting Association certified instructor, master rigger, and world champion skydiver. He's performed mishap analysis on past skydiving fatalities. The main reason that people would have malfunctions, usually it's a human pack and error. If you don't have a good parachute packed, now you have to get rid of it eventually and go to your reserve. And nobody really likes to go to their reserve for any reason. A perceived malfunction can be just as dangerous as a real one, especially for a novice skydiver like Shana West. It was just a beautiful sunny day, kind of abnormal weather for October. The plane ride to altitude takes about 20 minutes and it was pretty standard as compared to all my other dives. I was comfortable with what I was getting ready to do. Her instructor, Rick West, at the time also her boyfriend, videotaped Shana's jump so she could review her form following the skydive. Then when we got to 10,000 feet, it was time to leave the airplane and do the jump. And Rick climbed out first and he was standing on the side of the airplane waiting for me and he helped me out of the plane and then we let off at the same time and we free fell from 10,000 down to 5,000 feet. She waved off and deployed and uh, everything looked really good. I saying, good job, that's my girl. But everything wasn't good. Doing some practice maneuvers, I lost control of the parachute. I heard a loud snap and I thought in my unexperienced mind that I had broken lines. You can't fix broken lines. Your only option is to get rid of it. And it's not a malfunction, but they perceive it as a malfunction. And then they go to the next step, which is getting rid of their, their main parachute and then opening up their reserve parachute. Shana spun downward completely out of control, forcing her to jettison her main chute. And I really quickly deployed my reserve parachute and it came out and it was just a flat, a straight up malfunction. It just did not do what it was supposed to do. Shana! Shana! Pull the brake! It came out with a hunt slider and a tension knot, which prevented my parachute from opening all the way. Upon abandoning her main parachute, Shana's reserve parachute automatically deployed. But because Shana was in a spin at the time, the lines of her reserve chute became tangled, creating a tension knot. The knot prevented the slider on her reserve chute from descending. The slider's normal function is to slow the opening of the canopy, but in this case, the stuck slider prevented the reserve chute from fully opening. Instead of having a square parachute, I had a triangle-shaped parachute, um, cupped the wind, caused me to spin. And I'm thinking that she was in trouble, that she wasn't, uh, she wasn't doing fun 360s. And that's when I start yelling at her. Well, I was pumping the brakes. I'm spinning out of control and I see my problem, but it's just so far out of my reach that I couldn't do anything about it. At a certain point, you have to give up. There was nothing else I could do. I had fought it until I couldn't fight it anymore. And it was just time to face the reality that I was gonna hit. And it, in my mind, I was sure it was gonna be it. You know, I was certain I was gonna die from that impact. But the chance of surviving an uncontrolled free fall from over 10,000 feet while remote is not impossible. Perhaps the most famous incident occurred during World War II, when Nick Alcamedi, a Royal Air Force tail gunner, leapt from his burning plane without a parachute and fell 18,000 feet. Pine trees and a thin layer of snow were all that broke his fall when he landed safely behind enemy lines. To absorb shock upon impact, the US Navy encourages a knees-bent landing position and collapsing in the following order. Feet, knees, buttocks, then shoulder. But can a skydiver actually increase his or her chances of survival in an uncontrolled freefall? In a fall from 15,000 feet, with the correct head downward body attitude, the subject could control his lateral trajectory by as much as two miles. This could provide the opportunity to select the best landing site. In Shana West's case, she had no control over her fall and was virtually parallel to the ground when she hit. 
If I hadn't have been spinning so fast, and actually, see, at the very end, I lost consciousness. So I landed belly to earth. It dispersed the impact throughout my body instead of putting it all in one spot. Damn it! She spun it all the way down and uh, impacted uh, belly to earth in a parking lot, and it was just a big pop. Sheena's speed upon impact, 50 miles per hour. I was very confused as to where I was, what had happened, and why I was still alive, because I truly had expected to die when I hit, and to be alive was probably the biggest shock of it all. Shana was airlifted to a hospital in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where another big surprise awaited her. They checked me in, and of course, doing every x-ray and CAT scan and MRI and blood test that they can do. And through all that, not only did they discover all the fractures that I had, but they also came back with a positive pregnancy test that I was two weeks pregnant. They told me that the, they weren't sure that the baby was even going to make it through the extensive surgery she's going to have to have, uh, a lot of the medications to knock you out, you know, keep you sedated. So Shana went through the ER, then she had, oh man, long extensive surgeries, three or four in a row. Just about exactly nine months after the accident, I had a little boy and he is perfect. One, two, three, jump! Whoosh! All right. He has no lasting effects or damage. He is a spunky little two-year-old little boy now running around with as much energy as any little boy I've ever seen. Sheena no longer skydives, but she still appreciates the sport's appeal. It's an extreme sport. You, you jumped out of an airplane and there's, there's danger there, but that's what we all do it for. You want the adrenaline, you want the rush. You respect the sport because of the danger that there is involved. A skydiver crashing to earth can result in the death of an individual. But a single asteroid crashing to earth could potentially destroy all life on the planet. One of every 1,000 skydivers will die while making a jump. Crashes will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Crashes on Modern Marvels. Earth is under bombardment. Every day, 200 tons of meteoroids, ice and dust from space collide with our planet. Lucky for us that most of it disintegrates during entry into our atmosphere. Some, however, can't be stopped. In the fall of 1992, a meteoroid put on a spectacular display as it shattered upon entry into the Earth's atmosphere. A 27-pound piece of the meteorite struck a parked car in Peekskill, New York. A meteoroid is larger than dust, but smaller than an asteroid. An asteroid is at least 150 feet in diameter, but can be as large as a small planet. Comets, which can range in size from a few feet to tens of miles in diameter, are often described as dirty snowballs, since they are composed of ice, rock, and dust. They're also distinguished by a glowing tail. There are nearly 1,000 known asteroids that cross the Earth's path, which are at least a kilometer wide. When large meteoroids, asteroids, or comets penetrate our atmospheric shield, the results can be catastrophic. 50,000 years ago, a 150-foot diameter meteor crashed to Earth in the Arizona desert, creating a crater half a mile in diameter and 570 feet deep. The projectile that hit at Meteor Crater is now thought to have arrived at the Earth at a relatively low speed, and that resulted in an explosion that's roughly a couple of me uh, megaton equivalent TNT. That's 150 times the magnitude of the Hiroshima atomic bomb, powerful enough to excavate 175 million tons of rock. But that collision is dwarfed by the six mile wide asteroid that crashed to Earth 65 million years ago in Chicxulub, Mexico, off the Yucatan Peninsula. The debris it scattered into the atmosphere created an impact winter, 
blocking out the sun for months and disrupting the food chain. With that much debris in the atmosphere, you would expect the entire ecosystem of the Earth to be affected. 80% of all animal species, including the dinosaurs, became extinct. Our understanding of mega crashes with space objects took a giant step forward in 1994. Observation of impact plumes from comet Shoemaker-Levy 9's collision with Jupiter sent shockwaves through the astronomy community. This was, of course, very exciting to scientists. First, because of the ability to predict and then observe uh, such a phenomenally large uh, event. Second, because people became a lot more concerned about that possibility here. If Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet had collided with Earth, it would have wiped out all human life. It's no coincidence that three days following the comet's impact, Congress authorized NASA to create a system to map and track asteroids and comets that could threaten our planet. NASA's solution was NEAT. NEAT stands for Near Earth Asteroid Tracking. It's a program run by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here at Palomar and in, in Hawaii, where basically they're looking for asteroids that, that are gonna come close to the Earth at some point. Currently, the NEAT program operates from here at Palomar by using a 48-inch telescope that robotically searches through the sky during the night and photographs different regions, re-photographs them, and looks for moving targets. Although Palomar Observatory is equipped with a giant 200-inch Hale telescope, its 48-inch Schmidt wide-angle telescope is better suited to searching for asteroids. When you hunt for asteroids, you don't know exactly where they are. And so having a wide-angle telescope, that's the perfect tool for the job because you can see so much at one time that uh, if you use a giant telescope, you have a narrow field of view, and it would take much longer to, to hunt through that same region to actually see anything. The Schmidt telescope gathers light from the night sky and focuses it on a 160 megapixel electronic camera. Each night, the neat camera takes 20 to 30,000 pictures. A microwave relay system sends images to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory 150 miles away. Computers at JPL analyze these data, sorting out those images that suggest comets or asteroids. NEAT takes three pictures of the night sky separated by 30 minutes of time. The software looks for moving objects against the background stars. NEAT's mission is to identify 90% of all comets and asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit, which are over one kilometer in diameter. If a one kilometer asteroid hit a major urban area, the destruction would be cataclysmic. But what can we do if NEAT locates an object on a collision course with Earth? If we suddenly found that there was an asteroid tonight that was gonna hit the Earth, there's nothing we can do. But if you have years notice and you can convince a government to actually do something about it, then you certainly have the opportunity to, to save the Earth. Probably the, the worst thing to do to nudge an asteroid is to blow it up like in the movies. Because you're gonna create more pieces and they're gonna go everywhere and those are definitely gonna hit the Earth. But if you can get a spacecraft there, you can actually change the path, the orbit of that asteroid. We may be in for a close call in 2029. On Friday the 13th in April of 2029, there will be an asteroid that will come so close to the Earth that if you're in Europe that night, you'll actually be able to watch it go across the skies. It'll, it'll come closer to the Earth than geostationary satellites, but it will miss. We know this for sure. There is some uncertainty as to its exact path, however, and if it falls within a very specific path, seven years later, it will return and hit the Earth. That impact could result in as many as 10 million casualties. But scientists estimate the odds for such a collision are one in 45,000. Still, by 2036, let's hope we have a deflection plan ready to go. While many scientists look skyward for answers, there's one group that's looking inward, crashing together subatomic particles in hopes of unlocking mysteries of the universe. But some fear they may trigger doomsday in the process. In 1996, an asteroid almost a third of a mile wide passed within 280,000 miles of Earth, 
the largest observed object to come that close. It was discovered only four days before its close encounter with our planet. Crashes will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to crashes on Modern Marvels. What are matter and energy? What are space and time? Tiny crashes may provide the answers. 30 miles west of Chicago, at Fermilab, a 7,000-acre research facility, scientists smashed together subatomic particles and the world's largest and most complex machine. The Tevatron Collider is the highest energy collider in the world. Its basic purpose is to study the fundamental laws of physics, how the universe is put together. Fermilab needs so much land area because the accelerator itself is quite large. The ex main accelerator, the Tevatron, is approximately four miles in circumference. And then there are other accelerators that also take uh, lots of space. What the Tevatron is accelerating are trillions of tiny protons and antiprotons, which travel in opposite directions. Protons, along with neutrons, are found inside the nuclei of atoms. Crashing protons into a nickel target at extremely high speeds produces antiprotons. This is the Cockroft-Walton accelerator. It's where the protons begin their journey on their way through the Fermilab accelerator complex. And that's a tricky business because you're starting them out at rest and the way you get them started is just by applying a very large voltage. The energy of this machine is 750,000 volts. In tunnels 30 feet below ground, the particles build up speed as they travel in opposite directions around the four-mile course of the Tevatron. Each time a particle makes the loop, it's given another little kick by a radio frequency field, building up momentum until it's making nearly 50,000 trips around the track per second and approaches the speed of light. Powerful magnets line the underground tunnels to bend and focus the particles on their course. Once the particles are fully accelerated, they're allowed to collide. A massive detector, or particle camera, records the millions of collisions that occur every second. It looks at the particles that come out from this collision. They leave traces of themselves behind. And then what you get out is, is for each individual time that a proton and an antiproton smash into each other, we create a very detailed picture about what happened in that one collision. Scientists analyze these data, searching for dark matter, other dimensions, and the origin of mass. This is the main control room of the Fermilab accelerator complex. From this room, every device in the accelerator can be controlled. There's something like 100,000 devices, and we run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you had to reproduce this facility, it would cost several billion dollars. Remarkably, the Tevatron is being reproduced, only on a much grander scale, halfway around the world. The Large Hadron Collider, uh, or LHC, at uh, CERN, which is a European laboratory centered in Geneva, Switzerland. The actual accelerator is so large it goes into France a little bit. The LHC is about three times the size of the Tevatron with magnetic fields that are about twice or more what we can produce here in our accelerator. The LHC is so powerful that some fear the collisions it generates might actually create a black hole capable of sucking in our entire planet. The scientists at Fermilab who have collaborated on the project dismiss the concern. The idea that we would generate a black hole under these conditions that would swallow up the Earth is such a remote possibility that no one would take it seriously. The high energy collisions the LHC will produce may release a variety of previously theoretical particles, including the Higgs boson, the holy grail of subatomic physics, that might explain why all other particles have mass. These barrier shattering collisions are just another example of the violent release of energy that we call crashes. To paraphrase an earlier physicist, Sir Isaac Newton, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Unless, of course, something happens to get in its way. <laughs>